Good morning, Arlene. On our YouTube channel, usually within two business days of the event. So we don't edit it, we just throw it up there. So it is what it is, but it's there. And so people can refer back to it. Um, during the cafe, if you have questions, you can enter them in the chat. And after the presentation, we can go through those questions and hopefully we'll have time to answer all of them. And if not, we will forward them to John and Lance and Steve and let them answer them um, in perpetuity so you can keep that conversation going. Um, I want to thank all of you for being engaged and for joining us because I still remember you know, being in Arizona and being elected and the only time I heard from my constituents was the day after a big vote when they let me know how they hated or loved what I did. But no one that ever gave me feedback before that on anything. So this is such a great opportunity for all of us to talk to John and Lance and Steve and find out what the plans are for next year and what they're thinking about and how, let them hear what you think, which is why they're here today. And with that, John, the meeting's yours. Thank you. Um, well, I, th I think the meeting's ours, actually, and, uh, and not just Lance and Steve and I, but um, we're mainly here to have a conversation. So I don't really want to, you know, I have, I always have a lot to say, but I, I do want to just say it's really great to see everybody. And um, <clears throat> I'm really grateful that I've got um, two department directors here, you know, part of the leadership team of the city um, here with me, um, because they've got some institutional memory and experience that I don't have. And you know, we take this um, engagement with the business community quite seriously. Um, and we're, you know, it's funny. Um, I feel like we're starved for that too. We were talking about being starved for social uh, interactions, but um, you know, I think um, the intersection between the city and the chamber um, and the business community, you know, is, is, is myriad. And, and I guess as a, as a relative newcomer into town still, I think I could claim that until November 1st when it will have been a year Although I think you need what, like at least a couple decades to say that you're, you know, actually got your feet on the ground. Um, you know, I think our ears are really open, you know, and, um, and to some degree, I heard somebody say that Lance, who's been here for what, Lance, five or six years, um, that you're a newcomer. And I thought that was hilarious because Steve and I have less than a year probably between the two of us. Um, so we just, I wanted to maybe frame up something really briefly and then, and then open it up and, and actually really focus around some of the collective challenges I think that we're facing as organizations because, you know, the city's a different beast than perhaps your own beasts, but, um, you know, to some degree we're all tied together <clears throat> and the impacts of COVID in particular are impacting us in ways that we have to be dynamic and creative and, you know, crisis management and uh, futuristic all at the same time. And, um, and then maybe discuss a little bit about what do, what do we need to know as a city to better serve your needs as a business community and how could we work better together. So to me, that's kind of like the Uber frame. Um, I do have some slides that I thought maybe, hmm, maybe I'll just take a quick poll. I don't, I don't have the poll set up here, but um, I, I wanted to set the frame with um, our Engage PT initiative, but put a twist on it. Um, and maybe if you could just kind of give me, if, you're, if I see your video, if, if you know generally what Engage PT is, can you just kind of give me a hand raise? Um, Mari, uh, Brian, okay. Why don't I just quickly share my screen and I'll just whip through these slides really fast just to give you a sense of what we're trying to do. Um, and that kind of sets um, a bit of a, a tone for the kind of engagement we're trying to uh, do overall with a the, with the, with the broader community, but then we can kind of focus it down um, specific to the business community. Before I do though, I think it's important to introduce my sidekicks. And um, frankly, um, they, they bring a lot more to the table than I do for this conversation. Um, so I'll say, you know, just say a few words about each and then maybe Lance and Steve, you could just um, give a, a little sense of who you are and what you bring to the table. Um, Lance Bailey's our uh, development services director. Um, he's got his hand in the air there. Um, and Steve King's our public works director. 
And I've been really, um, really excited to work with both of these gentlemen. Um, and and the, the fusion between public works and development services is probably of most interest to this group because of what it does to enable economic development. And I know this is something at the very top of both Lance and Steve's minds. Um, so I'm really, it's, it's, it's great to have them here. And maybe, maybe I'll just turn it over to you guys just to you know, give your own kind of opening welcome, a little bit about you um, before we dive into just a few slides on Engage BT. Sure, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, uh, first, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, it's always a, a, a good opportunity to to talk to the business community. As as John mentioned, it's been it's been odd times. I think everybody everybody understands that. Uh, in in terms of our relationship in City Hall, where we're not open to the public, so we don't have people coming in. And then and then just as a a, a resident of the community. The, a little bit of a, dis, a disassociation from the businesses uh, and, and the way you engage with those businesses. And so um, it's, um, you know, we're, we're trying to on the fly put together procedures for, to, to keep open and, and, and do the, the functions uh, that, that at least go through my department that, um, you know, keep the business community going and, and, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about some, just some of the things that I've noticed and, and uh, uh, maybe get some, some feedback from, from you folks about uh, maybe how, how you're seeing that dynamic as well. So with that, I'll pass it to Steve. Well, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, Steve King. I've been here since March 23rd, so just a little over six months. And it was, I think, one of the, right around when the governor shut things down. So it was a little bit of an interesting transition. So I'm very thrilled to be able to attend uh, and, and meet people and see some names and faces uh, as I really am looking forward to engaging in meeting people in the community. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, just a little bit about my background. I came from Wenatchee. I worked as a private engineering consultant for a while and then worked for the city of Wenatchee for 18 years and, and did a number of things while I was there. My last... Um, last uh, job title when I was there was economic development director and I worked a lot with the, uh, the downtown there as well as uh, business in general trying to improve the financial sustainability of the city of Wenatchee and um, I think the fun part about it for me was it really helped me understand the the relationship between business and governmental services and how they're joined at the hip, um, both need each other um, to have an effective city, a city that functions and works well. Business isn't doing well, then the city's not doing well and uh, uh, vice versa. So, you know, the infrastructure part of, that's one of the city's core functions, roads, water, sewers, stormwater, you know, if the streets are flooding, that's not good. And so, um, so I'm really excited to be here in Port Townsend. I'm thankful to be here. It's a beautiful place. And um, I am learning, drinking from a fire hose, uh, trying to understand the infrastructure systems. I'm anxious to learn more about the business and what drives the economy here in Port Townsend so that we can tailor those infrastructure systems for a sustainable future. So that's it in a nutshell. I, you know, I'm, I, that's about all I can offer at this point in six months. <laughs> I think that's a wrap. So any questions? No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so Steve, Steve says he's drinking from a fire hose and, and I'm, I'm kind of encouraging all of us to sort of aim it somewhere to put out some of the fire. <clears throat> so uh, it's just hard to choose which one. So, so, hey, why don't I just quickly go through some slides because I'm, I'm kind of taking the shameless opportunity and I'll go really quickly. So anybody who has kind of follow up questions, I can come back and I could, you know, either speak to you or your group or whatever it might be or, or send you the slide deck or just show you the URL. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss an opportunity to, um, let me just see if I can queue up the slides here. Um, does everybody have this in front of them? Okay. Um, to just kind of frame this in terms of how we're trying to engage with a broader community. Um, and um, again, I'm, I, I bet I can do this in less than seven minutes, but um, why, what is EngagePT? you know, where are the opportunities to engage, what next? And then I think 
a most important uh, the discussion for us is really, you know, the challenges we face, what our needs are, and how we work better together. Um, but, you know, we, Steve and Lance and myself and other department directors have gone out and tried to engage with a broad number of groups and community members in Port Townsend um, to talk about, um, you know, some of the major issues coming across the city's um, decision making docket in the next year. Um, and and I, I guess what we've kind of realized is that, you know, especially in a time of COVID, it's, it's, we're, we're still very much committed to democratic engagement, you know, like we, we don't, um, you know, have, have as many opinions, we set the table for the community to decide and really take that job seriously and, and provide information and analysis and, um, you know, help our decision makers um, with direction. Um, and so we were already playing in 2000, in 2019, we're, we, we had a teed up 2020 that was looking really busy. Um, and then of course, COVID hit and we're, you know, really adapting that work plan. And so instead of having, you know, 10 initiatives and 10 separate things, we've really tried to bring some of that together. So um, there's some underpinning narrative and, and, and messages about how we do that. Um, one is we need to really dig deeper into what true sustainability means across our whole portfolio and how we integrate it together. Think about the long term. Um, and then, you know, I, I like to think about what great could look like where um, we have a, a sophisticated, connected, diverse set of opinions that actually we can all kind of gel together and, and move forward as a community with a with a general with the general sense that we're on the same page that we're rowing in the same direction um, and I think that's enhanced by the city's ability to to be a platform for civic engagement so I don't want to talk too airy fairy about this but I do think that you know it's a lot of what drives me in my role and I think um, I'm, I'm looking for the city to take a couple steps up in our, our ability to convene and to collaborate um, and to listen to the community um, so that we can make better decisions. Um, Engage PT is only one of probably many ways we're trying to do that, but um, it's, it's sort of our, uh, you know, crisis, uh, you know, born from crisis, it emerges as a, well, I guess we have a platform, we have a campaign, we're trying to coordinate all this stuff together um, to reach across the community, provide better access, um, and actually, you know, engage people to have intrinsic value in actually getting people together, and whether it's online or in small groups, um, socially distanced. Um, but um, I, I think what we've, we haven't done particularly well in the past is to draw connections between um, some of the initiatives that we've done. They're kind of one-offs. You know, we do uh, a stormwater plan or we um, do a, a particular piece of infrastructure or we make a code change, um, but people don't necessarily see how it connects to what it means to their lives or their business. Um, or how all the issues connect together. And that's partly what we're trying to do here. So you'll see this brand and logo and you can visit the website for more and I could even just end right there. But if you go to the city website, it's pretty prominent. Um, and so we're trying to steer people there for the very reason that all those initiatives on the left side of your screen um, for this year, and, and these aren't the most important things for Port Townsend, um, they are the things that we need to make decisions on in the near term. And so budget at the top all the way down to, well, water supply at the bottom, and then there's a, a toolkit that we're offering folks. Um, all those initiatives need some level of council decision making, and they're connected, um, and most of them are underway right now. So for each of these 10 um, that you see across your screen, um, there is, and again, I'm whipping through this, there's kind of a main question, some background, uh, desired outcomes, fiscal considerations, a schedule, and how you can participate. And we're trying to make that easy, and that's all in two pages. So again, accessibility, we're trying to get to people who have limited time, um, who have got a lot on their plate, um, and actually just be a, a, a kind of a portal for people to come and understand the basics. And of course, there'll be more information and more resource uh, we started a survey to kind of gain, uh, get people's interest of, you know, what level of interest you have in some of these initiatives. How do we stay in touch with you? Do you want to actually participate um, as a, um, you know, a volunteer? Um, you know, these are, the, these are a few of the opportunities here um, that we were listing. Everything from just getting on the website um, and pushing some of the information um, to some tools like the toolkit that allow people to have discussions amongst themselves. Um, to some experiments and, and community art and outdoor events and a big hat tip to, to Mari for her fierce partnership um, and, and working with us on, on making this um, very, uh, very possible. Um, 
And then these ambassador uh, small group conversations. So you can download a packet, invite a small group of people to a Zoom meeting, um, walk away with some general ideas that you can feed back to the city so we can take that into account um, on one or many of the initiatives. And um, that's kind of what that little toolkit looks like. It's pretty, it's pretty homegrown. Uh, you know, we, we did it in house, but um, really just a way to get people to come together and discuss some of these issues. Each of them has a timeline. Um, this is just the budget one. Um, this is them all together. Um, it gets kind of complicated, but you could see that we're busy and all these things kind of string together between now and the end of the year and, and actually a little bit beyond. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's continued opportunities, you know, to actually get people to, to be involved in ways that we're going to try to keep bringing this forward. So the reason why I wanted to, um, let me just flick back here. Um, the reason why I wanted to frame it up like that is because that's really targeted to the community and um, it's pretty broad and pretty general. But um, I'm looking at this group and thinking you're both community members, but also the business community. And I think we, we've really struggled to have a, um, uh, a direct channel to what your needs and to what your concerns and to what your aspirations are uh, for, for Port Townsend and Jefferson County. Um, and so I, I think that's why, why we're here is that we want to, I want to kind of seed all the rest of my time uh, of this hour um, and, and actually get a sense from you, you know, what are the challenges you're facing and, and where does that intersection with the city, you know, and, and how can we get it better and how can we uh, partner and collaborate better? Because look, there's no mistaking that we're in some really difficult um, times. And as we try to march through our budget process right now, you know, we're looking at just probably like you, uh, an uncertain uh, forecast of what the revenue looks like for the rest of this year into 2021 and possibly beyond. Um, and the very real impacts that has on city services and our ability to prepare for the future. So um, we want to open up that conversation with you. And I think this doesn't have to be the only time we do this, um, but we, we need to understand much more clearly from you directly um, what you're feeling and how we work together to get to the other side of this. So maybe I'll just pause there, make sure that um, from Lance and Steve's perspective, I'm not missing anything critical. I know that they have lots of ideas here and um, I just wanted to frame the conversation to start. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you covered it well, John. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard, uh, um, you know, um, maybe just drawing a little bit of my past experience that, you know, business, uh, um, uh, always has unique challenges and COVID just has made it crazy. So, um, you know, we, we have, we can see from, from government side, what is happening, but we don't see it from business side. So the insights that if, it, if there's any insights that you can provide through questions or, um, uh, or thoughts, it might help change the way we do things to help that, um, um, you know, it's not like we're getting these massive, checks and you know funding sources and um to to help things out so we got to figure out creatively how to how to um, assist business i think one thing just one thing i would uh add tie into what steve just said is is kind of the equity issue uh you know as 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 we've gone through the these phases uh of closing and reopening it's affected this different businesses in different ways. And, and I think that one of the things that um, input that could really help the city is, uh, you know, we, we've done things like with the streeteries and, and things like of that nature. And, and maybe some of the businesses who, who didn't feel like, like that benefited them, it was benefiting, a, a, you know, the restaurants uh, more so. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're open and looking for strategies to, to across the board in an equitable, equitable way, do whatever we can to help those businesses. And, and, uh, and I know that it's been a struggle. Uh, and, um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's some input that I think would be helpful for us as, as we uh, finish up, up the year and move into the, into, into the next year. Maybe I could just add one last thing, and maybe I'm, um, I'm speaking about it too directly, but that's part of one of my flaws. Um, I, I, I think we've heard a little bit that, um, you know, on some of the issues that I just raised, the, you know, the 10 issues from golf course to mill contract to, you know, budget or whatever it might be. Um, 
you know, I know at least with some members of the business community, there's a reticence to step into the politics of this all because, you know, it's a, it, it tends to be, especially in these days, you know, there's divisiveness and even in, I suppose, in this town. And um, I think what we, as people try to sidestep around that, and, and, and rightfully so, because it's, you know, you don't want to get mired in it. Um, in a way, we, we miss an opportunity to hear more honestly where the business community stands, you know, and I guess what I'm hoping to do partly through this conversation and just also the offer to all of you is, um, you know, to have a, uh, to build some trust in the conversation between um, the city and the business community so we can kind of outside this, this sort of swirling politics around even, even locally, we could better understand where it is you're coming from. And so you don't have to pick like, are you for or against golf at the golf course? Or do you like the mill or hate the mill? I mean, those are not useful conversations, but um, understanding more clearly what the impacts of decisions or potential decisions are on the business community and your business is something we really need to measure and weigh. And if we're not having that conversation, if we don't hear from you, if, 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 it's, if it's a little bit too uh, you know, difficult to weigh in, then essentially we're not hearing anything. And I don't think we're all served well by that. So the floor is yours. <laughs> what are those challenges? Where's the intersection with the city? Look, we've also got really thick skin, Lance and Steve and I, and we could hear it directly, you know, things that don't work for you. Um, that's what we're here for. Oh, I can talk. <laughs> I don't want to be talking the floor. But I just want to say, in terms of getting input, you know, we're working right now with the city on a survey about the Open Streets Initiative. And I just want to encourage everyone on this meeting to go to our for Townsend Main Street Facebook page and answer and click on the Open Streets Initiative survey and then share it with your friends because that really does help make uh, an informed decision when you get a, an honest read on do, do you like the idea of open streets and is it is it a plus to have street eateries and is it a plus to have parklets or do you feel that does negatively affect your business if you're adjacent to one or whatever the concerns are there's room to comment and we would really appreciate uh, you filling out that survey by October 10th. And I just also want to say I've really enjoyed uh, working with Steve and the city on that process. And it is it is a tough one because it it is it benefits perhaps uh, one business sector over another. But there's actually some cross support, and the public has enjoyed the open spaces. And now we have winter coming. So what are we going to do about that? And uh, there's a lot of Main Street communities that are doing open streets initiatives, but it is a, it's a new way of, of looking at your space. And so it takes, uh, it takes some buy-in and some uh, education, but it also, it takes the reality of, of, you know, everyone is facing their monthly, you know, bills they've got to pay. And if it's, if it's not an asset for you, we, we want to hear about it. So. Steve, do you want to say anything about that? Because I just have nothing but um, gratitude for Mari. Um, you might be able to channel that uh, better because you've been working more directly with, with PT Main Street. Yeah, the, the uh, working with Mari has been fantastic, especially as a newcomer. Mari helped introduce me to a number of the uh, uh, business owners downtown and, um, and uh, in uptown. And so getting a chance to talk about open streets has opened the door to talking about parking uh, talking about other issues that uh, business has faced, the seasonality issues, the weather issues, those sort of things. So yeah, talk about drinking from a fire hose. That's been a wonderful opportunity at the same time. And, you know, one of the things that um, uh, I've learned over, the, over time is most of the time people come to the table when you're actually doing something. So uh, doing open streets has brought people to the table and brought issues up that maybe we wouldn't have heard about if we weren't actually doing that. So uh, just to, again, thanks uh, so much for uh, to you, Mari, for uh, engaging the downtown and uptown community and, and helping us through this process. And, and to Mari's point, we really need to think about the next six months and how do we get through that because it's, it's really 
what I've been hearing is it's even with the open streets, that's very challenging for uh, the food industry, the food services industry right now. Um, so as all other businesses. I also want to just add to um, just, this is kind of, it goes directly to what I was trying to say before. And, and that is the, the level of um, courage that PT Main Street's shown at, at weighing into some issues that tend to get quite polarized and, and, and tricky um, and people have set views on. And um, I just, you know, Mari, you've been graceful and courageous at kind of going into that with uh, how, do we, how do we broaden people's understanding about how to make this work for us? You know, we're in unprecedented times. Um, it requires creativity. It requires a bit of a stretch of the normal use of our, our street right away. And there are sometimes consequences to that that are negative for some businesses. And we've actually adapted our approach based on the conversations you've brokered. Um, and we've also had some courage to continue on and, and move through it because we've heard from a wide number of businesses and actually made those connections. So um, that, that's the kind of collaboration that I think is you know, it's, it's really, uh, it speaks volumes to what's possible here. The other thing I wanted to mention too is um, the, the CARES Act funding, which you may be tracking and, and some of those in this group have actually played a pretty significant role um, as in those six community groups um, in advancing some of those proposals. And so first off, thank you for that. Um, but, but also um, one of the things that's emerged from that, that we've, um, you know, our decision makers have agreed to fund if we can get the money out the door in time um, is a, uh, and you'll see it in the PT Main Street survey, um, is reference to tents and heaters and, um, and, and some sanitization. Um, and so thinking about the winter, as Mari was just saying, and Steve was just saying, um, through the Streeteries program, we want to be able to find a way to, um, you know, deploy some of those tents and some of those heaters so that those who need extra space and can't fit your capacity, but you know, you've got rain and, and cold weather, um, we desperately want to put those to good use, you know, and that group did make that decision and the elected members were really excited about that. So let's make that work. Anything more? Um, yeah. <laughs> no, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say if nobody else is, is going to say, that. I'm just wondering, is there something that you're aware of as far as relaxing the COVID restrictions? I know that going from phase two to phase three is a huge jump. I don't know if there's anything we can do proactively to, to start at least expanding what's available. Um, because I, I believe there were, you know, some businesses were 25%. If they could get to 30, that would, that would be a big help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, others might know this better than I, but I know that we had been putting, or the, we, the county <laughs> had been putting together their phase three application. And, and I know Mayor Sandoval and I are, are working closely with the chair of the commission and also Philip Morley, the administrator on how to do that and, and, and public health. Um, and I think we just didn't quite, um, we didn't get over the line before the, the, the states shut down the whole process. You know, they, they basically put a pause on all phase applications. Um, and so I think the sense I get given Jefferson County's really strong work on, on COVID. I mean, I, I don't want to, let's, we, we do not let our guard down now. This is the time that that'll be very dangerous. But, you know, when you look at um, so few cases over the last month, um, you know, and, and most of those 72 now, um, 70 have recovered, um, you know, it works, you know, that masking and, and social distancing and, and sanitization, you know, that works and we're showing that. So I, I, have, I have strong confidence that if we were allowed to move to phase three, that likely the commissioners would be heading in that direction. Um, and that would allow us a little bit more um, capacity, but I'm also not seeing that happening in the near term. Um, so I think, I think this kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier, you know, how do we get creative about space so that we can actually, you know, get to that 30% for you, for instance, and, and does that mean um, a little bit of parking or sidewalk or, you know, a, a street um, to be able to allow for that, uh, that distance? Yeah, I, don't, I, I really don't see that happening anytime soon. Oh, okay. I was going to say, is there anything that we as a business community can do to help push the process along? Locally, I, I think I would just encourage you to make your voice known to the commission, the county commission, but their, their hands are tied right now. I mean, this is really a state issue. And if, I mean, 
I don't want to discourage you for reaching out to the state, um, but I think um, um, the sense I get is that they're making decisions based on the best available science and um, the governor's office is, is very much taking a, uh, um, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to speak for the governor's office, but you know, we're looking at a winter where we don't know what's going to happen. And, and I think there's a bit of fear there about another surge of cases. So um, I don't know. Does anybody else have a better answer than my very bad one? John, I haven't heard anything from Commerce or the state uh, indicating. I mean, that's that's the question du jour is when when can you know the phase plan restart? I've heard nothing, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you could you could move to Florida. I guess they just my dad told me opened up everything. <laughs> but look yeah. for that surge. My my sister lives in Florida and she's left. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is a tough. I think this is the 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 pressure cooker right here for for businesses is. The, you know, if you open up early, then we're in this for a lot longer. Um, if you open up late, you might not be around to open up. So, you know, how can we get creative about that middle ground? So I have a, th I guess a question and um, I'm borrowing from a conversation Lance and I had uh, uh, over a year ago and it was about housing and how do we crack that nut? Um, because despite COVID and everything else, it still remains the number one issue uh, in Jefferson County and a lot of communities, I think. Steve and I haven't had a chance to connect yet, uh, but Steve, I gotta tell you, some of your former colleagues have reached out and sung your praises. So they're very jealous that we were able to poach you. So looking forward to working with you. But, you know, the question and obviously the intersectionality with the city is uh, um, quite a bit on the housing end, but I'd, I'd just throw it out there as uh, a question for, for folks. And I know that's something that keeps everybody up at night, but curious in the theme of today's discussion, uh, what thoughts people have. I'm gonna pitch that to Lance. I mean, I think we've got three coordinated but different perspectives on that. And um, Lance, you have some, uh, some thoughts there. Well, I can just, yes, um, just kind of the, the current perspective. Uh, we, even though we've been closed to the public and our, and our procedures and protocols as far as, as permits are concerned have stayed open, we've been really busy. I mean, we, we furloughed staff and it was a real struggle because the, our, our permit flow co continued. Um, you know, we've, we've uh, some of the public discussion, if you will, about housing issues that the city had been having pr pr primarily through the, the, City Council subcommittee, housing subcommittee, uh, and then some code amendments that we've been processing over the last two years ha have, have stopped. We finished the ones that we were doing. Uh, we will be starting back up. Uh, well, we suspended all of the subcommittee and, and many of the advisory board uh, meetings um, through, through the COVID, uh, well, because of that. And, and we're opening back up with the housing committee uh, on the 15th of, of this month. So that'll be the first meeting of that subcommittee that we've had in, in, in many months. And we had some proposals for some code amendments and some other things for the city to be looking at that we'll be bringing back to that, to that committee. I will also say that we um, have had a number of, of housing proposals that are sort of filtering in that that uh, none of them have gotten to the point of, of actual uh, permit submittals, but I think they're close and you may be hearing about some here in the near future, but it's things are moving forward. I mean, we're still obviously the housing crisis has gotten worse. I mean, uh, in in this situ in this period where people more people are working at home. There are people that are looking to move out of urban areas. And I've had a number of conversations with uh, local real estate folks about how the demand has, has gone up. And, uh, you know, and I think that we're just gonna continue to see that. And, and so, um, you know, we will, we will hopefully be able to get online some more affordable housing. You know, we're, we, we need a wide diversity of housing. It's not really one category. 
um, that we need. We sort of need all, maybe not necessarily more upper end, but we, we, we cover that. <laughs> We cover that segment fairly well, so I think um, we're going to be we're going to be gearing back up, and that conversation at, um, with some of the housing providers, uh, I think starting with the, the subcommittee meeting and in, in later this month is going to um, we'll we'll start to to see a little bit more of that public conversation. Steve, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll just share some observations. Again, uh, qualified as being a newcomer, but comparing and contrasting to community sometimes helps you understand where your challenges are. And, and um, uh, in Wenatchee uh, is locked in by mountains. And so they didn't have space to grow. It wasn't like uh, Tri-Cities where you just plat more housing developments. Um, so we dealt with housing very intently. And that was my primary uh, responsibility in my job where we did public private partnerships to develop housing uh, units and mostly it was targeted at multifamily because in Wenatchee they hadn't built multifamily housing for like 20 years so they were really deficient on that option of housing which tended to serve the uh, the workforce housing the market rate workforce housing uh, needs and so um, uh, we had made a really intent effort to do that and we were successful and I got uh, hundreds of units uh, built and it's still being built. And I think to, to piggyback on what Lance said, um, you know, the intersection with infrastructure, making sure infrastructure is available uh, to make development of, uh, easier is a really critical point. And um, it's pretty clear that that's one of the biggest challenges in Port Townsend because of the way it was developed over the, since the 1800s. And so um, anybody that engages in development activity knows that it's really challenging depending on where you are to get the infrastructure you need for housing. That said, um, hats off to the city for the efforts made in the Rainier corridor area where there is infrastructure and uh, like Lance said, I'm hoping that maybe uh, soon there's some announcements come out that would be uh, take advantage of that infrastructure for some multifamily housing. So um, uh, uh, that's a that's a great example of the intersection of government, uh, you know, providing those core services of infrastructure to facilitate housing. I really hope to see a, a, a successful project here. Uh, in the next year or two. These things take a while to put together on the private side as well, you know, so um, this is, this is uh, 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 quite a challenge here and, and that's what makes it fun for the engineer and me, um, but also um, recognizing we need the housing now, it's, it's also a, a frustrating thing too when we have developments that need infrastructure that we can't get. I guess I'll, I'd also add that the signals um, to the development community and to the community at large um, haven't always been clear um, and consistent. Um, and, um, and I'm not faulting necessarily the city or any department for that. I think it's just that we haven't had a, a clear voice about what we're looking for and what the vision is. I and mean, we have a comprehensive plan. We have, you know, documents that state what our intended direction is. But I think, um, I think doubling down on that and making it very obvious that uh, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna um, uh, have uh, any hope of um, creating affordability, we're gonna need to create some supply. Uh, we're also gonna need to work well together with the county and some of the providers on the affordable housing end of things. And it's really heartening that you know I could say I spend almost every day at some point with Philip Morley at the county, and I know our teams work really closely together too. And I think that's strangely a, a difference from. Um, previous years and um, you know Philip and I sit down with with Bayside and Habitat and Dove House and Oli Cap and um, a range of providers every week and we talk about this now and and I'm not saying we've got any solutions but I think part of it is you know I guess I look at it especially with the affordable housing side is that there's this puzzle and each piece needs to fit better together um, and right now I think at least maybe because I'm new it's not clear and, and maybe there's some overlap you know, and I think if there's a clear delineation of like who's providing what and what the continuum of housing is from affordable to market rate um, and how we work all together, I think we'll get far better outcomes. Great thoughts. Thank you. 
what else is on folks' minds? And, Well, let's see. Am I there? Okay. Hi, my name is Frank De Palma. For those that don't know me, I um, have a few businesses in town. I wear a lot of hats, but um, for this conversation, mainly um, I'm a co-owner at the CoLab, which is a co-working space in downtown. And all these issues come up all the time uh, in conversations with small businesses and entrepreneurs and people just starting out. Um, of course, housing is a huge one. Um, broadband also. So I, I, I'm mainly in the tech uh, community there. So um, that's another big infrastructure question that I know we have a lot of people working on. Um, and I just want to say, you know, I've been in town for a long time, but uh, this is, is really hopeful, this conversation and the fact that you're you're curious. I don't have any really issues to contribute or, um, or discuss, but I do uh, appreciate being asked to the table and also that um, so many people are willing to listen and collaborate. I mean, those those two things can really get us far. And that's one of the strengths, I think, of this community. And and so um, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity. And um, and we're here and um, we'll, we'll be participating. And I also have the ear of a few businesses in town that um, and uh, I'm definitely looking at that toolkit and how I can maybe help facilitate uh, some of the conversation. So, um, so yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Sure. Much appreciated. Hey, can I just um, respond? I don't want to call anybody out particularly, but there's a few chat um, items that have come through. And um, one of them kind of deals a little bit with tourism. And, and I guess maybe um, without kind of wading into something and, and putting my both feet in my mouth, um, I've seen recently at the political level some discussion of are we tourism? Are we local economy? Are we agricultural? Are we tech? Are we, you know, and um, and I think it's fair enough to have a conversation about identity. I think we kind of need to do that and it needs to evolve over time. This is my personal opinion. But, but I think the answer is and, <laughs> at least from where I sit. You know, and, and I think um, we spend a lot of time saying, oh, at least I've heard um, some say that we're too dependent on tourism. And um, yeah, maybe that's the case because now we're feeling the effects of lack of ferry service when the Hood Canal Bridge goes down when people aren't traveling. Um, but boy, we'd be a different community if we didn't have the festivals we have, if we didn't have the infrastructure we have um, to support all the people to come and visit. So um, I, I, I don't want to um, take too much flack for this, but I do think that we can be a, a, a strong tourist community as well as a local economy based community, too. And I think there's value in both. So I'd be curious a little bit about um, what your thoughts are on that, if, if anybody is, uh, is triggered to respond. Hi, I'll, I'll jump in on that since I've got some feet in a couple of those. This is Nathan Barnett. <clears throat> um, yeah. I have, we, have a, uh, we have the Old Consulate Inn, which is a small uh, bed and breakfast, and I'm involved in a lot of the local events, a lot. I'm involved in a couple of local events, but I feel like I'm uh, kind, kind of very aware of what's going on with those. Um, hospitality is being crushed. Uh, we're at, you know, it, I will speak briefly for my situation. We decided that we were going to take the highest bar for COVID. Um, we're closed four days. Any room that's used or occupied by a guest is closed for four days following, which guarantees a reduction of roughly 30%, you know, down to 30% of your income for that, for that space. I know, and I don't want to say that other businesses should do this. That's, uh, I'm also dealing with uh, family members who are compromised and our guests are in our house. So it's really hard. Um, but uh, from a tourism perspective, uh, obviously people aren't coming. Uh, I think, as you were saying, there's a lot to be said for, let's start thinking, do we think about uh, Port Townsend as focusing on local, um, but one of the big revenue streams for the city, especially in uh, high season, is bringing in uh, out of town dollars. Uh, and I think that's really, I mean, it's certainly important for something like an LTAC. Uh, I'm also a member of the LTAC, uh, the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. Uh, so that pocket of money has disappeared this year. Uh, there are a lot of other opportunities that we have, you know, and that's just a slice. That's just 2% of all lodging tax, but that hits almost, it hits so many sectors. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't know how long it takes us to get back. Uh, like my business, if we were dependent on income, I don't think we'd survive. Um, I have a day job. I also work in tech. Um, so uh, it's, it's really hard. I think our, hosp our, uh, our hospitality industry is going to continue to suffer and probably for another year uh, as people continue to be cautious and travel. Um, I don't know that there's a lifeline somebody can throw. Uh, the uh, local banks have been extremely helpful as far as like, we understand, we don't wanna watch you fail. Um, but I think it's just a long haul. Um, the opportunities, I will flip hats. The opportunities in tech, there are people who are going to be wanting to escape the city, the, um, you know, <laughs> moving north from California sounds really good right now. Um, the uh, opportunity to, well, acknowledge that there are probably people looking to Port Townsend as their next home with deeper pockets than we're universally used to is an opportunity that maybe should be, should be confronted as well. I don't know what that does to our community. And I know there are some concerns in that space. Um, as an ex Microsofty and I'm starting at Google, I have, you know, <laughs> I'm, I understand that community really well, uh, but this can also become a tech hub in the sweetest little Victorian seaport high tech community anywhere ever. Uh, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great pitch, but we'd have to know what we wanted. Those are two perspectives from the seat. Thanks, Nathan. That's really great to consider. Does anybody have any um, add on to what Nathan's saying? Because it really rings true. And I mean, it's a question of identity and maybe a question of equity. And, and I guess to Nathan's point, also a question of planning for what we want. And I mean, I guess I hate to say kind of like, uh, kind of cliche here, but, um, you know, the future will happen to us if we don't plan for what we're looking for. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in identifying what, what is it that we're looking for, you know, and, and how do we, how do we balance our values and, in, in, um, push in the direction that we want. And, and if we're anticipating a big influx of folks moving from cities, well, we, we better start planning for that now. You know, I was, it's probably not a great idea to listen to a podcast about climate refugees as right the same day as the debate, presidential debate and all sorts of other craziness happening. But it did, it did kind of remind me that there's some big changes happening across our country right now that, um, you know, we're, we're unable to avoid, you know, some degree of impact from that. And we're in a, we're in a pretty good spot for a lot of people who are in a lot worse spot. So do we plan for that? Do we go aggressively toward that? Do we try to defend against that? I mean, that's, you know, those are, those are some big questions for this community. Um, just to, to add a, a bit of a perspective, um, the, I've, I've been involved a little bit in, tr in technology education, uh, trying to do that, and I found uh, quite a bit of support and interest uh, in the people here uh, in that. Uh, what I did find, and this is a few years ago, so I don't know what it's like quite right now, was we were in sort of a catch-22 in that if somebody wanted to start a tech business here, uh, they had, had trouble finding the people to work for them. And if people wanted to work in the tech industry, they had trouble finding businesses uh, to hire them. Uh, so we we're getting more. I don't know if we'll cross the critical mass in that regard. But that is something that was my experience probably three or four years ago. I don't know, Frank may have something to add to that. Yeah, that's definitely been, been an issue at the CoLab as well um, with uh, a lot of telecommuters moving to town and wanting to have a, um, a place to live and broadband and also find talent and, uh, or those that are um, freelancers needing to find a, a place to work. And so kind of, uh, you know, a system, which is kind of what we do there is a system for connecting projects and employers with, with talent. And that, that is an issue. Um, and, and, but I have to say, you know, as telecommuting goes, uh, I, I think we should be embracing it full, full speed ahead. Um, I think that this tourism 
crash, while it's the biggest we've seen, it's not the first we've seen. And there seems to be a lot of uh, vulnerability there when you put all your eggs in that or, or majority of uh, marketing dollars and, um, and vision for the town, identity for the town in something that can be so quickly diminished by the weather or a ferry going out or something like that. And, you know, with technology, those outside dollars still come into town, but a lot more efficiently. Um, so there, there, I think there's a real opportunity here to maybe um, diversify the sectors. I mean, there, there are a lot of really strong sectors here. And, uh, and so I think that, um, you know, having tech and really expanding that and have it be one of the, the major ones is, is kind of something that seems to be uh, some low hanging fruit right now that we could capitalize on. So that's just my, my perspective. I'd be curious if folks have thoughts. I mean, because I, I, I see that as, um, yeah, part of perhaps, perhaps part of a, a, a solution. Um, I also wonder if this group has thoughts about how to keep those dollars circulating in the community more, you know, and if, if there are ways that we can work together or the city could play a role at making sure that we, you know, that the money that comes in for whatever reason doesn't quickly get shunted out um, and we lose the value of, um, or value add, or, or we lose the, the, the ability to circulate that value over time. But I don't know this place well enough to, to have a clear sense for how to do that well, but anybody have any thoughts there? Why are you mowing? <laughs> I just would like to say, I, you know, the Catch-22 or speak, saying to the obvious, but what attracts people to Port Townsend in many ways is our, our beautiful setting and our historic districts full of cool Victorian buildings and buildings that people care about and businesses that are interesting and restaurants that are fun to go to. And so now we are in, we, we have developed as a, tourism economy over these years and you know, diversification is so important as Frank noted, but right now, um, you know, we've got to support the businesses that are here because that's, no one's going to be attracted to a town that is forlorn and half empty, you know, so what can we do to support who, who our people are and when you, there's that common when you spend a dollar locally, it circulates eight times around. So that's when you when you put money into you buy office supplies at the office store. That office store worker goes and has, you know, lunch at a restaurant, and it just all passes around. So having a strong local economy is super important. But right now we are we are tourism based as well, and so how can we help the hotels and how can we help the restaurants and the business because they all they all rely on the mix of customers and, and uh, summer is what gets people through the winter typically. And now we haven't really had, you know, a spring or a summer and winter's coming. So, and we don't even know if we can have the festivals and events next summer. And that, that's also, you know, it hits the businesses and it hits the nonprofits that coordinate those events that, you know, earn income from them. So it, it's, it's a, and then those are supported by the business as well. And it's just, a, it's a quilt that works together, so. Yeah, well said. Well, Arlene, I don't wanna drag this out uh, too, too long here, but um, I'm, I'm just looking at time. We've got five or so minutes. I don't know if there's any formalities near the end, but I, I'd love to hear from more folks if, if people have thoughts. Yeah, we um, we don't want to shut down your questions, so please feel free. Yeah, or or even proposals for you know what, what is it that you might need from the city to um, either as you know individuals, but also as a collective um, to make progress in some of these issues we've been talking about. So I would tell you that from the business community that we hear every day. And we've all heard it for years, no matter what city we came from to hear, every city they say the same thing. It's really hard to get a permit from the city. It's really hard to make things happen. It's really difficult to understand how to get this done. And I think that during this time when you're not publicly open, and when it becomes much more difficult and with increased activity, 
that maybe there's a way that with um, some great charts and graphs and videos that you can take a perky jury way of walking people through the process to help them feel more engaged and more in control because i know people sometimes feel they have absolutely no control over the process and walk away or start to look for consultants to get involved as an interface when maybe they don't even need to do you want to be more direct about that early um, no, I think that. No, I really look. Yeah. I, I really appreciate it, and I think um, you know that's something that we hear hear about, and and um, I I think um, it's complex, and maybe you know, Lance, I don't want to you know put you in front of this one, but um, uh, maybe before Lance might share a few thoughts. Um, I've been really impressed with the team's efforts to make it clearer, and to to actually change a lot of things pretty quickly. Um, and, and part of that is just changing the ethos of how we get to solutions with people who have problems. And, um, and I think a recognition that I think I'd like all of us to understand is that there's some history here way before any, at least of the city team got here, that was set in place that made things what they are today. And some of that is crazy, I'll just admit. You know, there, there's ad hoc decision making and lack of consistency that we're untangling right now. And, and Steve and Lance are the two people at the very pointy end of that untangling right now. Um, and so I'm not promising like sudden, you know, transformation tomorrow, but you know, this is an effort that's been ongoing and, and something that, that the three of us spent a lot of time talking about, you know, right to your points early, how to make it clear, how to make it consistent, um, how to make sure people, I mean, sometimes people are going to get a no, you know, so some things aren't allowed, you know, unless you radically change the code. So why don't we get people to that answer faster instead of dragging them along the process? So I know this is something that's core to how Steve and Lance and I are thinking about taking the city and, um, you know, it's um, uh, maybe Lance, I don't know if you've got any particular thoughts or examples of actually how we've, um, we've worked recently to kind of untangle some of that. Well, I mean, yeah, and it's, it's a, and, and, and Arlene, you're, you're right. Every, every, every community has a, has a certain uh, form of, of, of this conversation. And, and there's, uh, you know, I will say with confidence, that you know, Port Townsend is 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 a nuanced community in every respect, and and uh, and 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 that's one of the reasons that I think that we we probably like to work here and like to live here. Uh, that nuance has complexities, and 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 there are there are situations where uh, we're faced with questions that that are you know, they're complex from the staff standpoint i mean you know i the, the i struggle internally sometimes and, and i've steve and i have had a lot of conversations since you know he's arrived here and, and he's seeing some of the same things that i have of, of how difficult it is for staff to respond and, and to be engaged in in that partnership and i think that we're we're trying to work as a team to do that uh, I, I'd like to make it easier on my staff in the same way that I'd like to make it easier on the on the people that are coming in and, and asking us questions. Um, some of those things we, that will will always be complex and nuanced, but I think that there are some fundamental changes that we can make, and we're committed to doing it. Um, it's a uh, it, it, there's 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 a, a whole myriad of issues or uh, you know things that that need to be addressed. You know, staffing is always one of them, and uh, you know, there's we we try to do as much as we can with um, with resources. We, you know, we'd always like to have more resources, but I think that one of the things that I've that I have really wanted to do is is to approach things in a strategic way, where instead of just you know this conversation of Oh, everything is really hard and it's difficult to get permits. It's like, okay, exactly what are we talking about? You know, like, is it, uh, you know, some things I'll give you, I'll give you two examples. One, oftentimes people have a complaint about the code and it's the building code and the city doesn't really control the building code. And so that there's, there, there could be somewhat of a, a loggerhead there where it's like, okay, well, here's the code that you have to meet. The city's adopted this. 
it's not that the city is being anti-growth or anti-development. Uh, it, it's that's it's just sort of that's the way regulations have gone. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, and I, I'll point back to some of the code amendments that we made for housing, where we listened to, we had some of the developers come in. It's like, okay, exactly, specifically, what can you give me? Can you give us examples of things that you're talking about? And we directly address some of those. And uh, you, I'm, I'm sure that people will be seeing here in the very near future uh, the the housing the the housing solutions network. Uh, if you those who have heard of it, um, has sort of subcommittees that have been working on different things related to housing. And they, they did a survey of people's experiences with uh, permitting with the county and the city. And, and I just have read uh, the first version of that yesterday. And uh, there's, there's, there's things in there, I, I look at it positively, there's specific things in there that we've already addressed. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested and I, I'm anxious to, to have that communication to say, yeah, we're hearing this and, and yeah, these things, you know, these three or four things here, we've, we've already addressed and, and we're gonna try to address these future things. So it's an ongoing process, but I, 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 do, I do think, I've been here four or five and a half years and I think that we're, we're we're really making some changes that are that are showing results. It's um, you know government moves slow, and it um, by by design uh, in, in some ways. But the more specifics that 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 I can hear that we can address, um, you know, because sometimes it's so broad that I'm I just it it it's hard to filter out and get to the actual problem. So. Uh, maybe just to jump on, on what Lance said there, and maybe this comes through my former economic development experiences. Um, to Lance's point, they, the codes that we have to abide by are hard, and sometimes we're in the same frustration as a business. Um, we're working through trying to get permits for our sewer plant with the state, and that's the same frustration experience of uh, not understanding clearly what the expectations are and trying to have to jump through all the hoops you know that'll be a big project for us next year and so can appreciate that that experience and and um, you know one of the things uh, that I like to try to think about and, and it's easier said than done it sounds so simple but our job is to help help uh, applicants anybody applying for a permit comply with the national the state and the local codes. And that's a, a challenging myriad of combining all these different codes and saying, this is how we help you get through, through this process um, and comply with those codes. So um, I'd, like to, I'd like to see um, the city be, be viewed at some point as being a facilitator, not a roadblock. And recognizing that sometimes, like I think, uh, like John said, the, the, um, sometimes there's the, there's the answers are no, and that's not a fun thing to share, but that's, we, we need to be able to communicate that quickly um, and, and try to find the, the way to the yes um, that meets uh, the, those code you know, uh, requirements so that nobody gets in, in trouble down the road. I would like to jump in if that's okay and just say I appreciate uh, the changes that are being made. Um, recently, I had some conversation with uh, Lance's department, and what I really appreciated was that people replied to my questions, and that hadn't happened previously. Uh, I think just that change in communication right there is just huge, and I understand you occasionally going to have to say no, and it's great to hear you say, let's figure out a way we can make it work. It's when you're left in a black hole just going, well, what am I supposed to do? How do I get to yes? And you can't figure it out on your own. It's too complicated. So uh, kudos to the changes that are being made. I'm really appreciative of it. And just wanted to say that. And then as somebody who does like to go travel and a little bit of a tourist, I like to go to places that are vibrant and are exciting and awful and have a very strong local economy. And I know it's very difficult to manage the two, but it's certainly when I get to one of those places, that's where I want to be as a tourist, is uh, watching a vibrant town or city uh, pulling it off. And 
time of COVID, everything's off the plate and we're not going as nearly as many places. So um, I know it's challenging, but that's um, from a tourist point of view, that's what I like to see. I, I know that we're over time, I, I, but there's something that I wanted to just really briefly throw out to this group. Uh, it's sort of another hat that I wear or a hat I wear as, as part of my job and just want to make people aware of this. But, uh, and, and I think that um, someone had made a comment about the fairies and, and I don't know if, if people are paying attention to what's going on with, with the fairy system. I mean, there, there's a big budget uh, deficit and, um, you know, there's th that they're really trying to struggle through what they're going to do for the next years. And I sit on the ferry advisory committee and there's conversations have come up across the whole network, um, about how there's no, there, there's really no firm data on what the economic impact the ferries make to individual communities, and we know that it's we know that it's a big that it's a big piece, um, but it, it's it's one of those things as you see, you know, the ferries, you know, it, I, we're probably not going to go back to two boat two boat um, service for for 2021, and there's potentially some budget cuts, but I, I don't know um, how and if we want to as a community put together some of this information if, if 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 we were this would be the time to start to do it um so i just i, I want to throw that pitch out there and, and uh, you know maybe put a put a, a a note here in the near future that to have that as a specific conversation but just it's it's one of the things that i'm seeing happening and and i and i want us to be prepared for it um and and for it not to be a surprise Thanks, Lance. I think that's a really great pitch and I'll swing on that one um, because um, I know that as Arlene and Brian know, um, I and um, Philip Morley from the county, Kevin Street from the PUD and Aaron Berg from the port have been talking about this very thing um, just this week. Um, and we're, we're trying to get our hand on some clear economic data and actually commissioning a very small piece um, for both the route to Coopville and also the Edmund Kingston to, to actually explore those exact things. Because I feel like that's a role that the agencies can play to tell the story to the state um, with an advocacy bent on this is going to be the impacts if, you know, you either close down this route or you have it, um, you know, so I don't think that's a, the end all be all though. I think that's a first step. It's sort of a defensive posture. And then, then potentially there's a, a much more robust, holistic, uh, you know, um, I know Steve and I've discussed this and his idea of, you know, working with WashDOT um, to actually apply some rigor um, on the impacts and the economic impacts um, to the communities that are affected. So at per perfectly on point and um, by the time we might talk with some of you next, we, we hopefully have a small little study already commissioned. So I want to thank um, Lance and Steve and John for joining us today and for allowing us to share in telling the story of the changes that are actually happening with the city. I think sometimes by asking the questions and opening the dialogue, we can help you tell the story, which is what all of us as organizations do least well. Sometimes we do really well at identifying and solving the problems and forget to tell people what we've done. So thank you for allowing us to do that and thank you for joining us. And we hope that you will come back and keep the dialogue going. Yeah, and in, feel free to reach out to all of us um, as well. I mean, we're partners here in this community, so let's work together. Thank you, Arlene, and everybody. Thank you all. And um, for those of you who aren't going to be joining the Chamber on Saturday, tomorrow of this week from 4 to 6 for the Jefferson County Community Leadership Awards right here on Zoom, um, have a great weekend. But we hope you'll pop in and join us and have a good time and celebrate the engagement of some amazing people and the time that they have spent over years donating their time and energy and commitment to the county and the city. So we hope you'll join us. Stay safe, stay healthy. See you everybody, thank you. Thank you.